this other area and transfer to clinical sites. I mean, that stuff's possible. Um, just keeping in mind that we want to make sure that everybody's happy. We don't burn bridges and stuff like that because we want to make sure that, uh, you know, if, if that opportunity doesn't work out and if it's not a good opportunity, you might be throwing away another potential good opportunity. <laughs> That's exactly the words I was looking for. Yeah, it's, it's a... Uh, it's a tough one, especially when you're looking in that new job market and as a new grad, um, man, it's tough, you know, because nobody, nobody, it, and you want to go typically where your clinical site is, is going to be the most uh, useful one as a new grad, but um, it doesn't mean that there's not other opportunities available. It's just that uh, if there's other candidates that have experience, it's going to trump you every time. It's just tough. And then you get into my experience where you become overqualified and then people are threatened because they're like, well, this guy's coming in with all this experience. You know, I don't want them coming into my lab. And it's like. I had that situation in Twin Falls. They turned down like a guy with 26 years experience. And I was like, he's going to be great. He's awesome. Right. This is going to be so fun for me. <laughs> nope. They didn't want him because of that reason. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I've had, we've had, a, what I learned when I worked in Colorado Springs, we went through a lot of people. You can get uh, well-experienced people, and sometimes you think they're going to be all that, and sometimes they are. Sometimes they're just amazing. Uh, but we had this one guy; he'd come in and he bragged about doing 20 cases a day, and it was just you know he was just this golden child, and he had these uh, letters of references from these well-known doctors, and it seemed all good. But when it came down to scanning, I mean, we we're uh, a high-production lab, and we needed to produce. Um, you needed to be doing a minimum of six to eight cases a day easily. And this guy was, you know, bragging about doing 20, but doing four. It's like, it, so. All talk, I've, no walk. I've seen it go both ways. I mean, I've, I've seen people that have come in and have been amazing. It really does depend on the individual, but it takes a unique manager um, to kind of uh, look past it and see what that person's true character is. Um, I guess the same thing happened in sports here in Spokane with my daughter. I mean, she was an amazing soccer player. Um, but if you didn't play on the right teams, you didn't get noticed. And so she played on this club team out in the Valley. But when she went to Ferris, nobody knew who she was, even though she was amazing. But they already had their minds made up when they went into the tryouts. So they ended up putting her on the C team. And then she killed it so much on the C team that the next year they put her on varsity they jump right past JV because it's like, but they didn't give them a chance. They didn't actually look at the, the quality of the person. And as a manager, what I would do is uh, I would do a scanning interview. I would make sure, you know, I want to see the interview. I want to know what they know, but I want them to scan. I want them to see, you know, how, how does the rubber, the rubber meet the pavement for this individual? Some people That's are willing to look at that. Others aren't. Yeah, our lab conducted scanning interviews. I thought it was super weird, but I, I mean, I see why they do it now. Well, Tammy was telling me that Brett, one of the guys at uh, the pediatric lab, he said, she said that he had been uh, doing some interviews and stuff at other places, and he thought that it was weird that they did scanning interviews. I'm like, why would, I, why would you not do a scanning interview? To me, that tells me so much more than somebody's reference. A reference is like, yeah, unless I know that person and know what they think and how they scan and stuff like that, it doesn't, that doesn't influence me hardly at all. The only time uh, that really influences me decently is if I do know the individual and, and they're raving about that individual, like, yes, this person really is super awesome and I trust them, then that might make a little bit of a difference to me. But otherwise, in, you know, letters of reference don't honestly make that much of a difference to me. Because the other side of it nowadays, because this is such a litigious society, um, you know, you could get sued for saying anything bad about somebody. So nobody's ever going to really say anything bad about somebody in a, in a reference. But, you know, you expect them to say something nice and good. But unless I know what that person's definition of good and, and exceptional person is, it doesn't make a difference. That's just my opinion. But I'm weird. So I get that. <laughs> So next year, students don't need letters of recommendation. <laughs> well, we do it as a matter of process. I think it's one of those, it's like sort of math. 
math for a lot of um, like college level classes is used as a screening tool. Um, do they necessarily use it? In ultrasound, yes, we do use it um, in our industry, but there's lots of industries that they use it as a screening tool just to filter through people, just to see if they have skills of uh, you know critical thinking skills and stuff like that. So it does have some value. Um, but you know, I expect every letter of reference to have something good to say about somebody. I mean, it would it would be a very poor choice of uh, of selecting someone to write your letters of recommendation if they didn't. <laughs> but on that point, your letters of recommendation, if you're coaching somebody to give you one, you definitely want them to um, be aware of really particularly good things that set you apart from everybody else. If you can get them to say stuff like that, um, that is huge. But otherwise, it's like, eh. <laughs> like I said, unless you specifically know the individual and trust what they have to say and you get them on a regular basis from that individual, uh, that can be helpful. All right, I guess we can get started. All right, any questions or comments before we dive in today? So we're talking about when good valves go wrong, good valves get bad. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, uh, Kathleen, go ahead. To clarify from the study guide, what equation is usually used to measure the effective orifice area of the aortic valve? Um, so which equation are we using for that? <laughs> So what is the effective orifice area? What is that, what is that area? Can you think of another name for that area? The, the vena contracta? The vena contracta is a type of measurement. That's just one measurement that gives you an idea of how much volume is going through an area. Uh, it, it's, it's looking at a diameter specific. Um, the assumption is, is it, it's going to be the same all the way around, uh, but that gives you an idea how much of that's going through. Does it give you a specific area? No, it doesn't. It gives you a ratio between the two, um, between an LVOC, for example, and the, and the, um, the aortic leak. So break down the term, effective agurgitant orifice. So effective means what? I mean, effective could mean it's effective, it's good, it does what it's supposed to, or effective could just mean approximate. I mean, it's, our measurements are never gonna be super precise. We're gonna, we're gonna get as precise as we can, um, but is our echo measurement going to be an exact size of a, a valve opening? The answer is no, we, we can't get perfect um, based on uh, our physics and our limitations and things like that. So. Effective just means kind of a, a closely approximated is what that means. Regurgitant orifice um, or just an orifice area. So orifice meaning the hole. Um, so what's another name for that? When we talk about aortic valve and mitral valve, what's the one number that you need to report on those when we're looking at a stenosis? LVOT. Aren't we just talking about the continuity equation again, though? We are. Yeah, so continuity equation is what we're going for. And the point is, is the effective uh, orifice is just the area. It's the valve area, the, the opening of that area. So it's a aortic valve area or mitral valve area. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Nancy. Then why is, well, I thought that the ERO was the AVA, but then why do we see this in the, handbook it says to do well, is that that's sideways probably You're but to get to get the r the ero we have to find all these things to get the ero so from this formula and steps the ero is not the continuity equation it's not the ava well, to get to it, that's correct. But the formula to obtain it, uh, to get the actual area, if you're talking about an area um, on the aortic valve, that's what we use. Now we can use PISA 
uh, we can use um, we can use an estimation using vena contracta, those types of things. If it's a if it's a regurgitation, if it's a stenosis, we can't use a regurgitation, obviously. Uh, we could do a planimetry. Um, so Kathleen, read that question one more time. Okay, what what equation is usually used to measure the the effective orifice area of the aortic valve. That's where I'm confused. There's several. So I don't know what is the usual. So what, what is usually used to determine? So what it's asking is- is, so uh, is, that, is it the continuity equation? Is it the vena contracta? I don't know. So what, what measurement did we discuss is usually being used for the aortic valve area? Continuity equation. It is a continuity equation. So what I'm doing is just trying to make you think that, you know, it's not all contained in one little box. It's making us think outside the box a little bit. That's that's the formula we usually use to determine the orifice size or area. Okay, thank you. Trying to give you a bit of a brain twister there. Right, but, but why do you have to to find the regurgitant volume and the regurgitant fraction to get the, you have to find the cross-sectional area through the um, continuity equation before you can find the regurgitant volume. And then you have to have those two things to find the regurgitant fraction. And then you have to use that to find the ERO. Does anyone else know what I'm saying? Well, the ERO is the effective regurgitant orifice. Right, but for right. for some reason, why do you have to find to all those things? And it's not just the CS, the AVA. Let me just quickly look up the formulas in. Where did you find that, Nancy? In the handbook. In the, in the handbook under the all the the measurements there's one for mitral valve i borrowed it from kathleen so i don't have the page number that's why i wrote it all down did you write the page number down so i can go to no it's in the it's in a green part <laughs> <laughs> i know i know it's in the back and i remember when we we were learning about ero last quarter it, you have to find all these things to get the ERO. It's not just yeah, sort of a step by step. Why I'm thing. Confused about it because the ERO is a little more complicated than the con ABA. Yeah, ABA. Nancy, yeah. I posted something in Discord. Is it that one? No. Wait. No. That's the ERO equation I found and I was going to refer to. Here, I'll take a picture of what I. Is it page 345? Maybe it has 10 steps. Oh, shoot. Never mind. What'd you say, page 345? Yeah, but it doesn't have 10 steps. <laughs> and I don't think that one's getting a, an area. That, that I know it is. All right, so let so we don't kill too much time. Let me look into, let me look into that a little bit more. Just looking at the terminology of it, it's not, it's not actually asking for ERO, it's asking just for effective regurgitant area or effective, uh, Orifice area, which is the size, it's aortic valve areas, which that's asking that question that you read to me. Okay. And judging based off of the measurement that uh, that it's asking for, what do we usually do for aortic valve area? The the answer is definitely we usually use the continuity equation. It's just putting in a different terminology. But I will look at. Uh, let me look at uh, that piece of formula a bit more carefully. Is on three fifty four. I think three fifty four of the fourth edition. 
Yeah. A fourth edition of which? Of the handbook. handbook. What's it called? Like, how could we search it? You're talking about the pocket guide? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I know I, I've got the newest edition in front of me. I've got page 551. Well, 550, 549 is where the uh, Giza start. I'm going to go look at that later, but. Okay. Yeah. I'll check that. I'll, I'll take a look. But that the question, the way it's asked, is the uh, is continuity equations the answer to that? No, that makes more sense. I just was looking at that wrong because I was connecting it with the ERO, and that's not what you were saying. Right. Good. Good. All right. Anybody else before we get going? Talk about these cool valves that uh, go bad. All right, here we go. Let me share my screen. Okay, so prosthetic valve. So I had somebody's, uh, one of my students one time came in with their uh, child in the room and unfortunately the child broke one of these uh, cool models that one of my students made. So if you're a visual learner, um, for a project once, they uh, the student made, I don't know, it's kind of a, it feels like foam, but it's like a plaster, you know, plaster scene or a whatever, Play-Doh type of a product and stuff that dries. But anyway, they made themselves these little cool three-dimensional valves. Okay, so these are, these are valve replacements that they kind of created. So if you're a visual learner, so you can just make something like this. There's a little ball and cage that they made just for their own. Okay, so you can do that. Um, so in essence, uh, this part of the section, we're gonna go over various things, but uh, just realize that when we, especially when we put man-made things into the body, and my, my AMP teacher years ago made a good uh, comment and that was that, you know, generally in medicine, we, we only do wanna do something if it benefits the patient, if the benefits of doing it outweigh the risk of doing the procedure, because the procedure, introduces problems it introduces possible infections it introduces uh you know opening new you know leaky vessels i mean it you know you could send a patient into arrhythmias it could be fatal i mean there's all kinds of things that we potentially introduce by doing these procedures so as we discussed uh last class that you know, if we put a, uh, a valve in a 70 year old patient and then we have to redo that valve in 15 years um, now you've got an 85 year old patient. Um, the question is, can that 85 year old patient even tolerate the surgery? Would they survive the surgery? We may be successful at doing the surgery, but uh, the whole procedure and the stress on the body of doing that procedure may, um, may kill that patient. So those are considerations that we have to take into consideration. Same thing when you're taking medications. We don't give medications frivolously. We want to, as we discussed uh, before, you know, when we're, when we introduce a new medication to somebody, um, we have to take into consideration other medications that they're taking because they can interact with each other. And, you know, sometimes they can compound an effect, um, sort of like our, our phasing of ultrasound. If we, if we get phases that hit at the same time, it can amplify an effect or, or it can cancel it out. And uh, sometimes taking a medication or a supplement by taking another thing may make that uh, more amplified effect or it may cancel out the effect that you're looking for so you know these are things that uh, need to be considered as uh, they're considering doing procedures and then the other reality is is that when's the last time that uh, somebody implanted something into the body that was man-made that lasted absolutely forever right um <clears throat> somebody was saying uh i can't remember if it was a ted talk or something i was listening to one day but they're basically suggesting, you know, you know, you you take the like a human heart, for example, the human heart from the day that you were born, I mean, is developed before that, it has to last, you know, potentially 100 years. I mean, how, how many man made things can we put into the body that, you know, all you do is your regular eating and exercise and stuff like that to maintain it. 
Uh, we don't take it out. We don't service it. It doesn't need an oil change, you know, stuff like that. In a car, uh, for example, if we could buy a car that you could buy um, that didn't have to have replaceable parts or things that could heal themselves per se, I mean, it's a pretty amazing, uh, it's an amazing organism that we have uh, in the human body. So the reality is, is that these man-made things don't last forever. Uh, they can either jam up, they can uh, get stuck either in an open or closed position and with respect to these valves. Pieces of the valve can crack, they can break off, um, they can allow for things to attach to them, uh, like thrombus, for example, or, a, or an infection, and uh, get like a vegetation. So there's different things that can happen, and that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. If my pointer will work for me. There we go. All right, so this table, again, it's a uh, reference to chapter 15 uh, in the old book, but the new book is, uh, is our current chapter. Um, <clears throat> same type of table though. So we're gonna just look at some various complications. And again, this is no means do you have to memorize this. I'm just giving you an example of what could be happening and how echo plays a role in it. And in essence, how does echo play a role? is us you know, visualizing what's happening, just like we're doing the normal heart structures we wanna see in two dimensional and M mode. You know, what is the problem? What's the functional problem? Uh, then we wanna demonstrate that with color Doppler and spectral Doppler and show the severity of uh, what's going on. That's in essence what ECHO is gonna do for all of these. But we could have a primary uh, mechanical failure. So it could be a ball valve, for example, that uh, ball valve variants or ball variants in other words the shape of the ball changes over time um, as the ball in a ball valve um, is continually hitting the struts and uh, in that cage um, and at the base over time that can vary the shape of the of the ball um, if you're dealing with many many years um, so that may change the shape and if we change the shape that may not seal quite as accurately as it used to uh, strut fracture, meaning that uh, you could get a crack in the strut itself, which causes damage, which causes it to bend um, and potentially even break off. We have non-structural dysfunction, so uh, patient prosthesis mismatch, uh, ingrowth of panis. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about the mismatch. So we discuss the mismatch on children if we're implanting a valve into a child um, and we put the, the valve size that's appropriate to their age. You know, at five years old, well, what if they're 25 years old? There's going to be a different requirement uh, and a different size now, the overall heart that that's going to be need, needing to be changed. Um, anybody know what a panis is? Well, I think of the that kind of panis, but I'm sure this yes. is something else. No, that's exactly what I'm talking about. So that kind of panis, so if you'll, you'll notice this on, on patients, this is kind of a I don't know if it's a medical term, but it's used in the medical field. Uh, a panis is kind of an overgrowth. It's, uh, it's usually when tissue protrudes over the structure. Um, so we see this uh, when you're doing vascular exams. Uh, the, the panis is the, uh, the portion of the patient's belly that overhangs the belt area and the groin area. Um, uh, when you get into morbid obesity, where, where patients are grossly obese, um, you'll notice a, a large panis uh, completely covering the pelvic area. So that's an example of panis. Uh, another example is, uh, is with the heart valve itself. So if I've got a valve and I've got tissue that kind of grows onto it, the tissue may actually start to encroach on the valve structure itself and kind of grow over that area. Um, if it was a ball valve like this, where I've got the ball that's supposed to come back and forth, I'm going to probably break this in the process. So that's not going to um, but this ball may move, and if that growth kind of comes over and encroaches on the valve area where it seals, uh, that's going to um, prevent the ball from sealing and uh, seating properly. And so that panis, that overgrowth of tissue, is, uh, is what the panis is. And that can interfere with uh, function of these uh, valves and different structures. Um, that often begins by a um, kind of an inflammation process. And, you know, obviously, if we're sewing in a new uh, device into a patient, I mean, that whole process uh, initially can cause quite a bit of trauma to the tissue. And uh, like in the IMT, for example, so intimal medial thickness of a carotid, if we were to strip the lining of that when they get significant uh, calcification and stenosis, uh, one of the biggest problems is within the next year, um, 
where the intimo is cut off and stripped, uh, that tends to swell and causing a, a mild degree of uh, restenosis uh, because of that process. Same thing happens in the heart. When, uh, when we implant these valves, it can take a good year or so to really get back to normal-ish, okay? So that, uh, you know, the, the inflammation process and the valve uh, replacement is not, you know, just a few days. It's not six weeks. It's, you're talking a good year for these uh, types of heart things to, um, to heal, to be uh, to the point where they're stable. Okay, so that's what a tannus is. So an ingrowth of tissue or, or tissue overgrowth onto the structure itself that causes um, a malfunction of the valves or not allowing it to function to its potential. Uh, bleeding event. So obviously if we nick an artery or something like that, we can cause bleed. Uh, in echo, so in echo, I talked about talking about the structure and seeing the structure in 2D and color and Doppler. Uh, bleeding events, you can see it in 2D as a blood pool collection, like out into the uh, pericardial um, space. Um, it could be, you know, from, from uh, chamber to chamber. Um, we're looking for leaks where they don't belong. Uh, so you're using 2D to visualize it. You're using uh, color Doppler, spectral Doppler, if there's an actual jet uh, going into those areas. Oftentimes, it's just a, a leaky, a slow leak. So you won't ever notice it really on a color Doppler, but um, if that's starting to encroach on the space that the heart lives in, uh, that's going to vary the amount of pressure that's, uh, that's exerted on the heart. Um, endocarditis, as I mentioned, uh, it's not abnormal to have inflammation, particularly after surgery, but you know they could have like the dental pig procedure. Somebody might have had pneumonia for too long. Um, different cases where they get sepsis and stuff that, uh, that gets into the heart and causes that whole inflammation process with or without um, uh, bacteria or fungus or something like that involved. Um, <clears throat> abscess, dehiscence, all that kind of stuff. If we have dehiscence, our job in echo is to prove that it is not stable, that it's a rocking motion of that, and, uh, and proving that there's a leak uh, around the outside of that structure, which is not normal, um, except immediately after surgery. Um, thrombosis, so sort of like uh, the panis, that overgrowth of tissue that interferes with the valve structure itself and its functionality. Uh, thrombosis would do the same thing, but thrombosis uh, stands a little bit higher chance of breaking off and going downstream and causing things like strokes or pulmonary embolism. Um, we're talking the left heart, uh, which is usually the case, but it, it could be in the right heart as well, and that gives us sort of a pulmonary uh, system. Um, and then embolism, um, embolism could be various sources. So that, that again can be a thrombus, that can be a bit of tissue that breaks off, that can be, um, you know, bubbles, it could be, it could be a piece of the valve structure itself of that uh, replacement valve. Uh, anything that goes downstream and floats off that doesn't belong there is considered an embolism. Oop, just blocked out, sorry, there we go. All right, so specific uh, causes of dysfunction. So uh, due to inherent gradient and complex flow profiles, uh, valve mismatch between the valve and the patient is a problem. So we've kind of discussed this already again with the idea of putting a valve in a kid um, and that kid growing uh, to a different size. But if we had put um, the wrong size valve for the individual, so if I took a uh, you know, little lady that was uh, 98 pounds, for example, um, and probably like five foot two uh, versus somebody who is uh, six foot five and uh, 300 pounds. Uh, that's a very different valve size required for that uh, individual. So, you know, putting the wrong size and, and it kind of comes back to us in a way as an echo tech. Uh, if, we, if we don't perform our measurements correctly and accurately, we could, uh, because they do base part of how they size the valve on what we say in our reports. Now, we say it in our reports, obviously, the cardiologist uh, has to confirm that, but, and it is ultimately their job, but uh, we're the ones that actually take the measurements and do it. So if we misrepresent what that size is um, by not being exactly in the middle of it and uh, taking good, accurate measurements uh, in the right locations, you know, and if we're talking about the LVOT, you know, just on the LV side of the annulus of the aortic valve, for example, if we take it too far down onto the mitral annulus leaflet, for example, um, that's going to make it significantly bigger than it really is. 
uh, and then they might, you know, if, if they went based off our information alone, they're gonna give the wrong size information um, and put the wrong size valve in the individual. Okay. And then, uh, and perhaps people are okay at rest, um, but when we put stress on a patient and put them on a treadmill, they start just exercising at home, they're out hiking trails, uh, whatever it may be, when we, when we induce that extra, extra, that extra exercise volume that comes in from those cap pumps, uh, that could change things on that valve demand as well. So maybe at rest, it was okay, but now that I'm stressing the patient, maybe that sends them over the edge. That's a straw that broke the camel's back per se. Uh, so we want to assess the function. We want to know the size relative to the patient. Um, we want to quantitate as much as possible, giving an actual measurement or sets of measurements. Uh, the stroke volume and exclude any other causes of valve dysfunction. So if we see types of dysfunction with uh, valve mismatch, um, we're looking for those higher velocities in particular. Now we do know that the, that the prosthetic valves do have a little bit higher velocity, but we shouldn't be over like two meters per second. If we're getting a solid, you know, two and a half meters per second, that's not a normal size valve if, if it's functioning properly. Now you can get prosthetic valves that uh, get stuck and, uh, and don't open the way that they should that become uh, dysfunctional based on other things that we've talked about like the pan is screwing over and things like that. Uh, that's, and, and so there we're identifying that the cause of stenosis is the panis and not because the valve is functioning normally, but it's just too small. All right, so stuck valves. Uh, so again, due to thrombus, it could be panis formation. So again, thrombus, um, <clears throat> it could be vegetation too. I mean, any of the things that kind of hang on the valve, uh, if they get stuck on there, you know, if I've got a valve that's supposed to be opening and closing, and something uh, gets on the hinge or, or starts to lip up onto it and starts to get a little surface that it you know, hits against, um, <clears throat> at some point that's gonna not allow it to shut all the way or open all the way. So that can cause either a stenosis or a regurgitation. Um, and obviously from there, then we take and we perform our echo and we show the degree to which that is stenotic and or, um, or regurgitating. Uh, again, that could revolt, re result in either stenosis or regurgitation or both. Um, and it could be, well, it's always difficult to distinguish a thrombus from a panis because in 2D is how we evaluate these things. How can you tell the difference in 2D between a thrombus, a panis, and a vegetation? Is there any characteristics that you can think of that distinguish it distinctly? Um, well, a thrombus is super mobile. Vegetation is usually upstream. Okay. Usually, yes. Usually. Usually a thrombus is mobile. Not always. It can be, it can be, it can be laminar, it can be close to the surface. Um, vegetation is usually on the uh, upstream side. A tannus, it just depends. It doesn't, it doesn't have a side of the valve that it particularly likes. Nancy? Bacon said you have to do a TEE to dis really distinguish it. Yeah, you do. So the point is, is, is off a 2D echo alone, transthoracic, we're not going to be able to tell enough information based on that. Even the TEE, it gets us better detail of it, which is good, and it will probably be done. Uh, but even with that, I still can't distinguish if it's uh, a thrombus versus something else. They, we technically need to have blood tests. We need to have other things to prove that that's in fact what it is. We're going to give our strong suspicion uh, and recommend that, but we can't diagnose it completely based off the echo alone. Okay. And when we talk about vegetations, uh, when we get into the endocarditis section, um, we can never uh, diagnose a vegetation just off echo alone. And it has to be done in conjunction with blood tests to show blood cultures and things like that. Um, so the point is, is with these structures, they often look similar to each other. And echo alone can't uh, distinguish it. But we can tell them it's there and we can tell them it's causing a problem uh, with the valve structure. Okay, thrombus usually is more mobile. It usually is less echo dense, um, but usual doesn't diagnose 100% of the time. Um, okay, and the panis will be usually confined more to the, uh, it's not, so panis doesn't develop just on the valve itself, for example, uh, independent of any other tissue around it. 
uh, because it's an overgrowth of tissue, it has to come where there is tissue. So it's usually around the valve ring and stuff that it starts encroaching on that space. So you can have a trauma suit that goes in that space as well, or even vegetation. Okay, both of these do have uh, small and large. Both small and large traumas can have a hemodynamic uh, significant change. So does it have to be a big thrombus that uh, causes the valve to stick? No, it just has to be enough to, uh, you know, to throw a wrench in the, uh, in the work, for example, in the gears. Uh, so if it's in the right location, a small thrombus can make a big difference, uh, or you know, it might take a bigger thrombus in a different location to cause the same amount of change. So the size of that thrombus doesn't necessarily matter. It's more of uh, where it's affecting that valve. We're going to assess the valve leaflet motion. Um, this can be done uh, in transthoracic. It can be done in transesophageal. Um, we can look at it in 2D, and we will. And we can also look at it in M mode to see what motion changes there are there. Uh, and it can use fluoroscopy as well if you're looking at uh, looking at the dye to see uh, how that motion is going. Okay, so here's just a couple of uh, pictures. So, <clears throat> so bileaflet aortic valve, which is, or this is a mitral valve in this case, this looks like a bileaflet valve. Let's probably just read the cap, see if I can read it. Um, regardless, like we've got this valve here. Uh, this is your valve structure here. This is our struts on the sides. Uh, the left atria, so this is from the transesophageal. Part of that you can tell because of the angles that are displayed on your screen. Um, that's transesophageal. Uh, so if we're looking at this, we want to see these leaflets. There's a lot of shadowing and stuff like that, but we shouldn't be super concerned about that other than if we need to see something behind it, we need to see a different window. Um, but from the LA side, we're looking to see what's in that. We're looking for the motion of those leaflets. So if I had a bi-leaflet, for example, it's supposed to open and close, okay? Um, maybe one of them is opening and closing and the other is stuck. Okay, so that's something that we as an echo tech would need to notice and report on. Uh, maybe it maybe it's supposed to open all the way like this. It has a it, it always has some angle when it opens, but normally the opening might be like this. But maybe maybe one's coming down nice and open, the other one's coming only about halfway down. So you'll notice it's only moving a little bit instead of a lot. Uh, so again, those are things that we want to notice. And then of course here, as you can see, they've got a significant leak. So we want to uh, demonstrate that leak also. Did you have a comment, Nancy, or I saw a hand out of the corner of my eye, so good. Um, <clears throat> specific causes then uh, continue. So echo can play a role in selecting patients for thrombolytic therapy. So what is thrombolytic therapy? Blood thinners. Okay, not quite blood thinner. So Thinner will prevent it from clotting and stuff, and, and it does thin the blood to some degree. But remember, uh, thrombolytic means that it's actually eating, you know, the, the lytic term means that it's eating it. And so that it's actually dissolving kind of that clot. It's, it's breaking that clot apart. So um, like Drano, Drano for the vascular system? Say that again, Casey. Is it like Drano for the vascular system? Kind of, yeah. You know, I once had a patient on a carotids, uh, actually, I think I was demoing at Siemens and I was out in the clinical site and, and the person, no, it was a patient, whatever the situation was, uh, the patient told me, they're like, yeah, if I drink enough alcohol, I think that should dissolve the, the uh, plaque in my carotid arteries. I'm like, you're probably right. I mean, if I took a chunk of plaque and put it in alcohol, it probably would dissolve it, um, but I'm pretty sure they'd be dead by the time that had any effect. If your blood alcohol is that high, that's a problem. So yeah, it's, uh, it does kind of dissolve it. Now, what do we know about thrombolytics that, um, and we're talking about patients here that typically have valve replacement. Do you want to do that anywhere near a surgery? Nope. Okay. So echo can be used again to uh, determine what's going on. We want to see if there's any possible bleeds, if there's pockets of fluid, say around the outside of the heart, like in pericardium. Um, any other particular leak where a thrombus would actually normally seal that, that area up. Um, amongst other data and stuff, they're, they're never gonna hang your hat totally off what ECHO does because we only, they only see what we show the doctors. But 
uh, Echo can make a difference on that. Um, okay. But as a rule of thumb, they're not going to do it close to you know time when somebody's had surgery or if they've had some kind of an accident or something like that, because we could reopen uh, bleeds that were sealed off naturally. Uh, overall success is 80 to 90 percent, but there's a 20 percent risk of serious complications okay, by using thrombolytic therapy. Uh, we must differentiate thrombus from tannus and assess if there is a poor clinical status. Uh, any previous strokes, extension of thrombus beyond the valve and the size of the thrombus itself, um, they would maybe contribute to making that, that patient not a candidate for what's going on. So basically do a thorough echo. You look at the size and the extent of that uh, thrombus formation, if you think it's a thrombus, uh, or if you uh, have information that suggests it's a tannus instead, um, that could change their path on how they uh, do these things. So is it appropriate to give uh, somebody thrombolytic therapy if it's a tannus that's the cause of the problem? No. No. So determining what it is as best we can is, uh, is important. So bioprosthetic valves have uh, fibrocalcific degeneration as well. So we're talking pig valves, porcine valves, uh, the, the uh, bovine valves or, or cow valves. Um, so they, they can get um, fibrotic, they can get calcifications on them, just like a native valve does. And so they can also have degeneration similar to that of a natural valve that we have. Uh, if this is the case, they almost always have regurgitation with them because those, uh, the scarring and the uh, calcifications and stuff prevent the uh, proper collapsation. Uh, up to 35% of porcine valves fail within 10 to 15 years. Okay, so again, you got about 10 to 15 years on a bioprosthetic and you got about 15 to 20 on a mechanical. Uh, <clears throat> pericardial valves tend to last longer. Mitral valve replacement showed greater degeneration and more so in younger patients. So that's just a tendency in that valve location uh, with a bioprosthetic valve. Again, the nice thing is, is that's not our choice as an echo tech, what valve they're going to put in the patient. The reality is we, we need to know kind of how that does change as we follow these patients up for cardiology. Scott, could you please remind what does it mean pericardial valve? So a pericardial valve is actually taking pericardial tissue and making the valve out of that tissue because it's a very strong, it's fairly thin relative to other body tissue, but it's a very very tough um, fibrous type of a, um, a tissue and they, they can actually use that to create uh, valves out of. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, so acute rupture, so something immediately breaks or happens. So acute rupture or fracture of a uh, calci uh, calcified leaflet will give sudden and severe regurgitation. So sort of like a flail leaflet would, if you all of a sudden broke that leaflet and it just started uh, work, you know, not working um, as it should, we can have a, again, the heart's not gonna tolerate rapid change as well. So we're gonna get a lot of regurgitation from those, no surprise. Um, <clears throat> we can image from the upstream side of the valve when it's torn or perforated, um, that might help us to see uh, what's going on. So do, again, just to remind what, uh, if I'm talking about the mitral valve, what side of the valve is the upstream side? So think of where the fluid comes from. The LA side. Okay, so if I'm going to look at an LA and I've got a valve replacement, uh, what do you think is the best mode of ultrasound to image with? The best mode? modality of ultrasound, of echo. So, so just 2D the or MO? thoracic versus transesophageal. Oh, transesophageal. Yeah, because it's coming in behind the left atria, so it would see it from the upstream side. We wouldn't have artifact coming across the image. Uh, whereas um, if I'm on an aortic valve and I'm looking at the upstream side, what do you think might see it a little bit better? Transthoracic. It's actually kind of six of one, half a dozen of the other on, on this one. It's honestly could be seen from either way. 
but we do get a good perspective from our transthoracic and it's much cheaper, less involvement with the patient and having to sedate and that kind of stuff. Um, so from a functional standpoint and a cost standpoint, it makes sense to go with transthoracic before we do transesophageal. Okay, good. Okay, so here's an example of a mitral valve replacement with thickened leaflets and sewing ring uh, that cause, that's causing shadows and inability to see MR behind it. Okay, so you can see on this uh, apical four chamber view, uh, you see the valve structure there, you see these struts coming out. Let me just get my laser pointer again to emphasize this a little bit better. Uh, the struts coming out up into the um, LV side, flow coming out here. You got thickened stuff going on down here. I can't see a lot of anything behind here. So I see flow coming in. It doesn't look like abnormal flow coming into the left ventricle, but can you see anything behind it on that view? No. Um, on the spectral Doppler, they're running a CW through there. Again, I always advise to use color Doppler as a guide regardless. Uh, however, they're just using a blind Doppler. Back in the day, they used to just walk the Doppler through. The problem is, is you have to walk it through and it takes several minutes to investigate the entire valve when color Doppler will show you right where it is. Um, <clears throat> or at least a much closer approximation. So with that CW Doppler, they can see that there is regurgitation going on to some degree. So maybe the 2D and the color didn't see it super well, this sees it. Uh, then they, they go to the peristernal long axis, which of course they started with. Um, and here they can see that there's regurgitation uh, from this particular view, but we don't even know the extent of that because there is a significant amount of shadowing off that valve structure. Uh, so naturally they'd want to do, if they saw this, they would want to do a transesophageal to get a much better uh, clearer picture of what's going on. Okay, infective endocarditis. So when we hear this, we're thinking uh, usually an inflammation process, but we're also thinking vegetation. We're thinking uh, growths that uh, might be uh, attached to the valve structure. Now, what do you know about a vegetation so far as far as how it presents on a valve? Okay, it's on the upstream side, it is highly mobile. Uh, we'll talk more about in more detail about that. We can't diagnose, this on, diagnose it on echo alone, even though we see characteristics that suggest that that may be the case. But it's usually attached to the valve tip. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in infective endocarditis, um, remember this is an infective process. It's it's usually attaching to a tissue. Um, can it attach to the valve? Yeah, theoretically, and it can grow if there's a little eddy current or a space where. Uh, I don't have a lot of movement of fluid that might uh, promote growth and it might actually attach to the valve structure. So it can attach to the valve structure. Uh, it's usually going to be more likely to attach to the near the base of that structure um, rather than the tips per se. But could it? Yeah, it could. Uh, so these are potentially catastrophic with prosthetic valves. Um, they're more variable, more difficult to diagnose, particularly compared to a natural valve. Uh, vegetations can be hidden in the shadows of the valve, so it's very easy to miss things with uh, with these man-made structures because they don't uh, they don't uh, relay the ultrasound very well. They reflect it really well, but they don't transmit very well through the structure. Uh, they're usually attached primarily at the base or the sewing ring of the prosthetic valve. Um, Tannous or loose suture material can, can also be confused with that. So you guys saw on 3D what sutures can look like. They those little bumps that we saw around those rings. Um, they can look similar to that and it might throw you off. So uh, just be in consideration of what's going on there. Uh, with vegetations, as we'll talk more about later, um, usually that patient has a, an active or an acute infection that's going on. Uh, they're quite ill. Um, and, and then they'll have blood work that coincides with that to help diagnose that that's actually what it is. Uh, they're not going to hang their hat just on echo. Yeah, Nancy? Do these sutures remain in there permanently? Yes, they do. These are sutures we don't want to fall on, that's for sure. <laughs> um, good. So imaging alone, again, can't distinguish a vegetation from uh, thrombosis uh, or a panis. Again, it's, they look similar and um, we need more clinical information to help make that clear. 
Um, <clears throat> usually we're going to resort to it's probably thrombus if the patient's not like acutely ill and, and has fevers and stuff like that. Uh, but they can get them without, uh, without having those treatments. Uh, clinical information is critical. Again, uh, the presence of fever, positive blood cultures is what they would take. Uh, they'd take the blood tests and look for actual cultures of uh, bacteria or, or uh, fungus in the cell wall. All right, ominous complication is a development of an abscess. So has anybody ever known anybody or, or themselves had a, uh, well, I know this. Hillary, didn't you have a child that just had an abscess on their feet? Yeah, my son's on massive antibiotics right now, and they cleaned him out yesterday. So uh, describe for me, I mean, it's it's his teeth, but describe for me his uh, pain and symptoms and stuff that he was experiencing. He's He had a jaw pain all the way down and then up through his ear. And when you look in there, you can see it, it almost looked like a big mass or cyst right behind his tooth. Um, and it was red and he was tired and not happy. Yeah. So I had one years ago, I was in my twenties, I think probably my early mid twenties. And uh, I actually had my tooth pulled out because of it. It, it hurt, it's, it's literally the worst pain I've ever experienced in my life. Um, of course, I've never had a baby or anything like that. I've never had kidney stones, but uh, in respect, it hurt a lot. Like I might, it felt like my head was going to burst. Um, they are extremely painful. Are they painful per se in the heart? I don't know, but uh, the point is, is once it seeds into a tissue, uh, you're basically getting uh, like a pimple, like a really bad pimple or a boil. If anybody's ever had a boil, they get very a lot of pressure inside that, um, but it's a growth of bacteria and stuff inside that thing, and eventually it might even rupture, um, which in the heart is not a good thing, especially considering it's going into the bloodstream and then getting washed through the entire body, uh, and then those um, bacteria or whatever's in there may seed into different areas of the body and cause other issues later, uh, but they can be very, like it says, ominous. Uh, due to artifacts, uh, TEE is not good at diagnosing these. We might see that there's a like a cystic type structure or something on there, but um, we're not super good at diagnosing it. Um, the transesophageal would be better at seeing it more clearly, but then uh, other tests and stuff might be uh, like a CAT scan or MRI might even be better yet. Uh, we must focus on the distortion of the tissue uh, subadjacent to the sewing ring. So you kind of want to look at the, so it's not going to be on the valve structure itself. It's going to be a, a kind of in that vicinity. Um, and again, as I suggested, uh, these may rupture and actually cause uh, stuff to come out of it. But what, what happens if a structure ruptures inside the heart around the valve? You could also get flow into it. Okay, which weakens that wall and that tissue, and it may actually cause a shunting around the valve structure itself, or even a shunting into a different chamber. Okay, so these infections and processes uh, can be quite devastating. Okay, so it may show up as an echo dense or echo lucent um, uh, structure, and it may uh, it may have color flow inside it if it has ruptured. Um, and we want to show that as we're doing our echo. Uh, perivalvular regurgitation uh, might occur late after surgery, uh, maybe due to an infective process. So if, if we're, you know, weeks after surgery and stuff, we're looking for the patient to recover, we're doing some follow-up exams, maybe that's when the abscess has developed because uh, we're still fairly close to surgical time. And maybe now infections are starting to uh, seed into the tissue and, and start to grow and, and take place. And that's where we may be uh, starting to notice it. Okay, so the dehiscence, the rocking, okay, so the classic rocking of the sewing ring. So again, the sewing ring is there. It's supposed to be seated into the tissue nicely, and it's not supposed to move. If my, if my valve is rocking and moving inside there, that means that one side of it's probably detached at one point. And what we want to do is show the extent of that, but... Um, we also want to show if there's any flow and stuff around it, if there's any kind of a hole or connection that's being made. Okay, and that is, uh, so the dehiscence is a serious complication of prosthetic valve endocarditis and is almost always associated with significant perivalvular regurgitation. So if we throw a color doppler on 
and speckled doppler, we should see a, a really good amount of uh, flow going around the outside of the valve, which is not normal. Um, a large amount is never normal. Uh, and that's part of the Duke's uh, um, diagnostic criteria in Duke Medical Center. Hey, Scott. Yeah, go ahead. So would it be appropriate to say that if we do see dehiscence, it's we should be looking for like an endocarditis type deal going on since it's almost always? Yeah, I think uh, that's definitely strongly in our wheels. The main, the main thing is when you see dehiscence is showing it to the doctor so that they can take the next steps to uh, correct it or they might need to do resurgery, like reopen it and uh, do it again. Uh, regardless, that, that's got to get plugged, that's got to get fixed. Um, perhaps the process was uh, initially an infection, and but the doctor will take that into consideration as well. Uh, our biggest job right now as an echo tech on dehiscence is to show and demonstrate that it's in fact rocking and that there's in fact a hole that's there that's leaking uh, around the outside. That's that's huge. Yeah, they'll kind of take it from there and determine what caused it, but more importantly, it's a matter of getting it fixed as soon as they can. And as they're going through that process, obviously they're going to be doing blood work and stuff to help diagnose uh, everything else around it as well. All right, so rocking of the mitral valve is re relatively easy. Uh, why do you think, relative to the aortic valve? So why do you think it's easier to tell if the valve is rocking in the mitral position as opposed to the aortic position. Just from an anatomical perspective, what do you think? The shadowing of the root in plex. Okay, so the shadowing that might be part of it. Now, often in both positions, you can kind of see it, <clears throat> but the tissue around the aortic valve is a little bit thicker, and uh, there's more stuff kind of holding it in place as well, whereas the mitral valve, we're more on to, we don't take that, we don't go necessarily in the exact annulus of where the mitral valve was. We're actually partially out onto the leaflets and stuff as we're uh, doing that valve, particularly the anterior mitral valve leaflet. So it's usually rigid and in place, but the, the tissue holding it together is a thinner tissue overall. There's less, there's less tissue kind of around it. Uh, but yes, the shadowing and stuff does come into play uh, to some degree also. Okay, in a stent list, uh, bioprosthetic aortic valve with the root inside of native root walls can appear like an abscess, but it is normal. So this is just a statement out of Fagenbaum at the time. Um, <clears throat> the point is, is if they got one of those conduit type things that's kind of inside the native vessel, it makes it look like there's pockets and stuff around it, which uh, could be looking like an abscess, but may not in fact be that. So knowing what type of valve or what type of uh, conduit structure might be there is, is very helpful in diagnosing. Because we don't want to diagnose normal things as significantly abnormal because then they start getting excited and doing very expensive procedures and you don't want to crack somebody's chest open again to fix something that was just normal. Okay. <clears throat> Mechanical failure. So uh, this is increasingly rare. So you saw those videos or the video on the Onyx valve. Um, you can see that these engineers and stuff put a lot of time and effort into getting uh, the best possible structures that they can, making them stronger, making them less likely to have uh, thrombosis and stuff attaching, stuff like that. Um, so it's getting better and better uh, with these newer valves. The older days, you'd, you'd see more of these types of things, but Thankfully, it's becoming more and more rare to have these types of failures. Uh, primarily, the failure is going to happen on a mechanical valve um, due to uh, manufacturing defects. And again, that's becoming more and more rare. Uh, so an example would be a gradual change in the shape of a uh, extruder ball. Uh, so that Star Edwards uh, ball and cage concept again, so that ball can deform over time. Um, and sometimes it causes the ball to be to get stuck either in open or closed position. Um, other models like the uh, bajort Chili valve occasionally develop fractures on the struts that result in embolization of the disc. And yes, that's exactly what it sounds like. An embolization is something that's going floating downstream now. Uh, so there have actually been parts of valves that have broken off completely and are now floating downstream. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, having a, a disc floating downstream in tubular structures that go through progressively smaller tubes, not a good thing, right? Yeah, um, yeah go ahead. 
do they still use the ball and cage? I thought they don't use that anymore. Uh, they there are patients that have them, so they they I I believe they do still use them. They're modern, more modern versions of it, perhaps. I don't think it's out of use. Um, but at the same time, you're still going to have patients that um that might still have these. So they last generally uh 15 to 20 years, but that's an estimation. You could have patients that have it for 40 years. You know, yeah. and as long as it hasn't caused problems. So I'm pretty sure they do still make it, but regardless, you uh will still likely run into the odd ones um in the clinical setting with some of the patients that you have. Yeah, I would assume that we'd still see them, but I read somewhere that they're they don't use them at anymore. So I was just curious. It's certainly less common, yes. Yeah, the other valves are certainly more popular. And in fact, all the rage right now is doing the TAVR valve. Partly because, you know, it's controlled by cardiologists um, rather than surgeons. And if a cardiologist is the one taking care of the patient, guess what they're going to prefer to do? Something that gets them paid. Not that that's the incentive, but... <clears throat> But honestly, the TAVR valves are less invasive for a patient and it is a, it is a good choice for a patient and they've proven to be uh, quite well. Yeah, doing open heart surgery is not really a great option. Um, but you ask a surgeon, guess what they're gonna recommend? Surgery. Yeah, did you have a, a comment too, Nancy? I thought I saw your hand. Well, I was just thinking it was a dumb joke. <laughs> like if I was a pinball fanatic, I, I would request a, a ball cage. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> But I wanted to bounce around a few times before it actually stuck, right? <laughs> yeah, pinball thing. All right. Okay, so we covered those. So yeah, we don't want things to embolize. We don't want them to break off. <clears throat> Here are some pathologic examples of uh, some of these situations. So uh, yes, I mean, we've cut it out. So there might be some of that stuff that's attached to it. Notice uh, on this what the sutures look like. In this case, these ones are green. Um, they're pretty decent size. So you could see those on 3D, those little bumps that we'd see. Now, do we see them like this on 3D? No, they're kind of more blurry bumps, to be honest. So there could be stuff hanging off to some degree. Uh, they should be the type of sutures where they are less likely to have things attached to them, hopefully. You can see on these ones that they're white, for example. Um, but what we're looking at on the valves here, so you can see that we got tissue stuff that's attached to the valve itself. Um, and this, this type of material that's coming on top of here, is that a thrombosis? That could be a thrombosis. Um, it could be tannus. This, this is a good example of tannus here where that, that tissue overgrows onto the valve uh, leaflet structure itself. Um, a little bit up here. You can see that uh, we've got some tissue or something that's gotten around this strut on this ball valve. And you can see that if that's inside that hole, it's not gonna allow the ball to seat properly uh, inside there. Uh, just a few examples of uh, some of that stuff. I don't think I've got any pictures at least there of uh, cracks and things like that. Our disc fractures have also been noted. So not only the strut fracture, but a, a fracture in the disc itself, um, they can, um, be detected with echo. Uh, they're becoming exceedingly uncommon again, simply because our engineering and stuff is getting better and better and uh, making higher quality products. Okay, <clears throat> so right-sided prosthetic valves. So as I suggested, it's not always gonna be just the left heart that has these valves, uh, right side can. Um, if it's on the right side of the heart, it's more common to be in the tricuspid position or gonna be the um, bioprosthetic valves. Why that is, I think there's just a greater uh, proof of uh, success of those and stuff like that. So um, you're just more likely to see it. Is it abnormal to see a mechanical valve there? No, I mean, it can be fine. It just depends on what the best situation and valve uh, fitment for that is, is right. Um, there's a greater risk of uh, thrombus formation in the right heart generally because, again, we have lower pressure, lower flow. Okay, so we, uh, we, because of that slow flow, we uh, stand a greater chance of thrombosis. It's more common to have an annuloplasty ring implanted on the tricuspid valve. So again, an annuloplasty ring is either, it's either partial like a C-shaped ring or a complete ring uh, that again, just kind of gathers the tissue so that we don't get a big regurgitation and sews it uh, into place, creating a false annulus. Um, 
so that's more common on tricuspid. Uh, part of that is because it's a bigger valve and uh, getting that much redundant tissue um, together and, and doing a valve replacement, um, that allows the valve to work somewhat normally. It's just uh, fixing the annulus uh, attachment essentially. Uh, echo will prove the placement of the ring and prove that there is no stenosis caused by improperly implanted ring as well as the degree of PR. So just like the dehiscence and rocking motion of the valve uh, replacements themselves like these, um, <clears throat> the annulus ring as well, that may become detached as well and, and kind of moving. They should be a fairly rigid structure. They shouldn't move a whole lot. If they're moving significantly, um, that could be problematic. It may reopen a, uh, a big regurgitation that was formerly fixed. Um, or and or because we're sewing into the tissue itself, we might have uh, well we would have poked holes through the valve tissue, uh, and there could be perforations now in the valve leaflets themselves also. Okay, pulmonary um, replacements are even less common. Um, so pulmonary pulmonary stenosis you're going to find is really more of a uh, pediatric thing. Um, it can happen in pediatrics, but they're usually in conjunction with some pretty big congenital abnormalities um, where they're doing these big procedures like the Ross procedure that we mentioned here. Um, and so you'll see them typically more in the pediatric uh, patient load. Uh, it's not very common to see a valve replacement in an adult patient uh, in a pulmonary condition. All right, principal, the short acting base and subcostal views are best for these. Um, just a tip from my scanning experience, the best zero degree angle place to get a view of the pulmonary uh, valve is actually from subcostal. Uh, it gives you a decent view that uh, gets you a straight on view of that, uh, of that uh, valve and uh, of the pulmonary artery. So the Ross procedure, um, you'll go into more detail on this in this fall with Mark. Um, but it involves replacing the aortic valve with a native pulmonary artery or pulmonary valve and a homograph put in the pulmonary position. Um, both the valve and the proximal pulmonary artery are replaced. So it's a big, uh, big procedure to fix a big congenital issue. A mild gradient and often um, pulmonary insufficiency are present. Pulmonary insufficiencies never really surprise us anyway. Uh, and mild gradient, just meaning, again, a little bit elevated velocities and stuff like that, but we don't want to be in the stenotic range on these valves. Um, <clears throat> they'll gradually uh, stenose due to degeneration. So again, bioprosthetic valves um, tend to degenerate um, over time as well. All right, and valve conduit. So there's a good picture of the valve conduit. Uh, one that has stent material in it. So you can see that this uh, echogenic material is inside and then you have your intimal layer there. Um, this is off a of carotid, but I just want to give you an idea of what the stents look like, okay? So you can see into it. Um, in the abscess uh, portion, we talked about, you know, maybe mistaking this for something with an abscess. Maybe there's, you think it's calcification with some abscess behind uh, that tissue. Um, you can see that there is a bit of a darker space behind there. Um, that can be that can be normal with the stent. So don't assume that that's necessarily a uh, abscess. Okay, so valve conduits are used for uh, congenital types of repairs. And again, in the pediatric kids, um, you're going to see some of these, and they may grow to be an adult, but uh, you'll still see some of these now uh, in an adult lab. Not all conduits have valves. Uh, they might just be a tube in that place. Uh, they can be bioprosthetic or they can be mechanical. Uh, they've got these ribbed designs, which cause classic echo appearance that you're seeing like on that picture on, on the bottom. Um, extra cardiac in nature. They are extra cardiac in nature and difficult to see, but Doppler is important. So meaning that uh, they're not typically inside the heart area, they're typically more up into the aorta in pulmonary arteries and stuff like that. So they are a little bit more difficult to see because they're surrounded by lungs. Uh, stenosis and regurgitation could be from the valve itself. Uh, it can be from the neointimal proliferation along the entire length. Um, so what is neointimal proliferation? Um, neo means new, intimal is the intimal layer. 
So it's a new internal layer that grows actually inside and along the, uh, the uh, conduit itself. It kind of uh, gets a tissue lining in essence. Scott, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that Doppler is important. Can you tell more about how it would be important and explain? Yeah, so when we have, um, so when we have these stents or shunts or conduits that are implanted, uh, the main thing is uh, Doppler to show that number one, that there is flow inside of it, okay? Because sometimes these things can have restricted flow and we don't notice it. Uh, they're a little bit tougher to see than a native vessel is, uh, but we wanna see that flow is in fact flowing through it. Uh, Doppler in particular, color Doppler is also helpful to see if there is flow going around the outside of that. So just like uh, when we place a, an, a mechanical valve or a bioprosthetic valve, we don't want flow to go around the outside of it, we want it to go through the middle of it. And so a conduit is just the same, we want it to go through the middle of it. Uh, we don't want flow going between the wall and that, or we don't even work yet, we don't want it leaking outside the vessel uh, altogether. Uh, so that's where Doppler is helpful, is to show that there is flow, and particularly in stents, all stents. Um, some of you will be working in echo labs with devascular. Uh, when you're looking at uh, bypass grafts and stuff like that, it's always important uh, to, to show flow in the middle of the structure, but it's also important to show at the ends of the structure, so either end of it, um, that's where the most likelihood is of inflammation causing a loose connection. Um, it can actually close up the vessel again uh, because of that. So you, you want to pay particular attention to the ends of it, but also documenting the flow inside of it. And not around the outside of it. Okay. Uh, Nancy? I'm trying to find this section in this chapter in the book. Can, do you have any tips? You did not have tips? a valve conduit section? Uh, I... There could be, it just didn't, like it followed, the book follows your lecture pretty dang well. Yeah. But then it went from mechanical failure to right-sided prosthetic valves to mitral valve repair, so. Uh, they might've taken that out then. That's right, it's good information. But right. that's about all I'm gonna require you anyway in conduits, just know that they're there, know that they're kind of those rib structures inside the vessel, just like we've shown here. Is it like an endograph then? Yeah, basically, yes. Okay. They can be, uh, they can actually take out whole segments of the aorta and they can, you know, end to end attach it. They can attach um, end to side, so they can take like a coronary artery and they can actually implant it onto the side of the vessel. Um, I think we covered that more when we talk about aorta uh, later. Um, but there's different ways of connecting it, or they can do an endograph where it actually does go inside uh, the native vessel as well. So there's just various ways that they can do it. Um, again, the point of these is knowing that they exist for one. Uh, for two, they can have a valve in it, either bioprosthetic or a mechanical valve, um, and just kind of knowing the general appearance of it and then proving that there's flow on either end of it and uh, in the inside of it, we want flow to be and not flow to go around the outside. That's sort of in essence, uh, the nutshell of that. All right, there we go, good descriptions. So here's the disease process. Uh, these might be the procedure. So just to, to verify off what I just talked about. So in this case, they actually went above uh, to this, um, this is called the sinotubular junction. So the sinus is the valsalva. So they cut off just above the sinus of valsalva where the tubular part of the ascending aorta attaches to the sinuses. They cut that off. They sewed this right to it. Uh, they sewed it up here as well, but you can also see more faintly in here, this part of it actually becomes an endograph on the inside of that. That was to fix this aneurysmal portion. Okay, so that's one way to do it. You can see these other graft attachments that are already part of that. Okay, so we have our normal three branching vessels. They actually have one big branch coming off of it uh, and then connecting individually to each of those. Okay, so that's, I mean, and, and there could be any combination of uh, this type of stuff going on. These are just some ideas. Uh, this one down here, um, maybe they had that big aneurysm and stuff on the ascending aorta. Uh, they could actually do, this one has a valve replacement in it. Okay, so that one had a native valve in it. 
this one uh, took out the native valve and put in the, uh, a valve. Uh, but notice that they took the native coronary arteries and sewed them to the sides of, uh, of that structure as well. So these are, again, just different ways to do these things. Um, here it's is, just like uh, being a plumber. Oh, it totally is. Yeah, it totally is. So Darren's uh, program, he calls that the, uh, the plumber of the human body, which it kind of is. They, they do the rotor rooting. They do all that kind of stuff. Um, the surgeons do basically the, the pipe replacements. Okay. And that's what these are. Um, and this is uh, just one showing a mechanical valve. This is a bileaflet uh, valve in, in this place. Uh, this one here shows the bioprosthetic valve. So you can see kind of what they look like uh, from a valve replacement standpoint. It's pretty cool what they can do. I mean, we live in a pretty awesome day and age as far as uh, capabilities go. And um, I'm really excited to see more about where artificial intelligence is taken. I think. Uh, it's pretty exciting. At the same time, if you've ever watched the show Terminator, the scenes take over the world. We'll see. <laughs> Let's. Uh, I, I always say to my kids, or one of my daughters in particular, we joke that it's the uh, it's the year it's the life in your years, not the years in your life. So you know you could live long and do nothing and experience nothing because you're scared to do anything. Or you can embrace it and just go with it, and if stuff happens, stuff happens. Now, there's the extreme of that too. You could, you know, skydiving without a parachute would be a dumb idea. You'd live really well for a few seconds. <clears throat> okay, so valve conduits again, just showing here uh, some of these coming off. So here's a valve conduit. So pay particular close attention here. So you'll see the the aortic ring, the annulus right here. So you see that's a more. It almost looks like calcifications on the walls of these. And you can see very hard, rigid structures there. This is likely a tilting type of a, like a bileaflet disc in this case. And you can see conduit material. See these little rib areas all the way along there? See those dots? Okay, that, that, is, uh, that is what a conduit looks like inside Echo. Um, and this one, this is short axis, and you can actually see the coronary artery coming off of an attachment uh, into that area as well. So this is our conduit. Is that a TEE view? Yes, they are, because we're coming in beside, uh, see the, the left atria is on top, so that's a good observation. Yeah, when it comes to TEE, it's really notice what chamber is closest to my transducer. That's, that's probably your biggest clue that it's a TEE. First clue is that it's a nicer image. And that you're seeing like actually a couple of centimeters of length of coronary artery rather than uh, what we see on transthoracic. Um, so first view, first clue is that we see it better. Second clue is what chamber is that you're seeing closest to the transducer. And that should tell you enough uh, what you're scanning. Uh, the, the other way, not a cheater method, but the other way is to see that reference angulation uh, diagram on your, on your, beside your image uh, will be a clue also that it's a transesophageal. Okay, mitral valve repair. So <clears throat> as mentioned, uh, we do our valve replacements. Uh, so TAVR is uh, the valve replacement that's the stent valve that's placed in the aortic position typically. Uh, that is now being done pretty frequently on the mitral position as well. So just be aware that there are stent valves being placed um, interventionally and not surgically um, in the mitral position as well as the aortic. Uh, but mitral valve repair is usually when we got a really leaky aortic or mitral valve and uh, we got some very redundant tissue. We got a big leak. Maybe it's because we got a big dilated uh, cardiomyopathy going on, uh, whatever the reason may be. Uh, in this case, they're going to go in and surgically kind of fix the valve, maybe cut pieces out of it, bring the tissue together, sew it back up, and then put like a ring, like that annual plastic ring around it. So you can see here. Uh, there's a ring that's uh, put in place around the outside of this here. Um, and here's the, the opening of the valve. But you can see all this extra valvular tissue that's out here as well. Uh, so again, as we look at that, we want to see that it's uh, seated uh, correctly. Um, so this would happen when repair is more advantageous than a replacement. And the doctors are the ones that decide what that is, what the reasons are. 
Uh, etiology and morphology is severity of the valve disease as long as the status of the LV makes echo really important. So it's our job to go in and to identify the scallops on those valves that are involved, uh, the extent to which it's involved, looking at any calcifications that might be getting involved. Um, if they've got significant calcification, for example, it'd be hard to do one of these surgeries because now you've got to cut around uh, calcific uh, lesions. Uh, so that may make it less likely to be repaired. But if it's just a, a fairly normal valve, um, repair might be a better option. Uh, it is preferred method to uh, correct the valve function on a leaky valve. They rely on precise and thorough assessment of anatomy and function to plan the procedure. So again, doing a good study that's good systolic and diastolic quantification is, uh, is important. Looking at uh, all the valve structures and how they're working is important. Uh, posterior leaflet prolapse is, uh, has a better likelihood of success and anterior or uh, bileaflet prolapse. I think that's supposed to say van, not an. I think it's supposed to say than. Yeah, it, it says uh, posterior leaflet prolapse carries a greater likelihood of success repair than does anterior or bileaflet prolapse. Yes, I would agree with that. I'll just fix that. Okay, so uh, location and extent of leaflet excision, uh, shortening of the chordae tendine and or the ring or annuloplasty depends on echo guidance. So. Um, again, looking at the at those structures, remember that uh, the chordae tendine and papillary muscles and all that are part of the apparatus. And uh, if there's something significantly affecting those, uh, can also affect how um, the success of these surgical uh, changes are. Uh, the carpentry ring is uh, that annuloplasty ring. It's just a brand. Um, preserved anterior leaflet mobility and restricted posterior leaflet motion is typically seen on a successful repair. So it is quite common to not see the posterior leaflet move very much at all. Um, and then um, you get a decent, uh, a decent movement of the anterior leaflet, but it's, um, it's going to be, you know, inside that ring. Uh, mitral MR is normal, but should not uh, restrict the flow. So it, may, it doesn't totally seal the valve. It doesn't totally fix the valve leakage, but we're trying to reduce it from a severe hemodynamically significant leak to uh, like a mild to trace amount. Uh, getting it to repair completely is uh, usually difficult, but as long as it's not causing hemodynamic uh, complications, that's what we're after. Okay, um, so you may observe a dislodged ring. So just like I mentioned with the valve, sometimes that ring actually detaches and can be free floating and rocking like the dehisked uh, valves are. And uh, it could dislodge altogether and be floating around in the chamber. Um, and obviously we don't want that to go much further than that. Um, the other type of uh, repair that can be done is called an alfieri technique. So this is a, called an edge-to-edge -edge repair. Um, it's a newer technique. It creates a fixed stenosis with a double orifice. So what they're doing in here, again, this is a severely regurgitant valve is typically what they do it on. And they're kind of gathering it together where the severe leak is uh, the worst, and they're actually sewing the tips together. Okay. So when the valve opens, I'm left with what's called a double orifice. So it opens here and it opens here. Now, we could reduce it to the amount that it gets rid of the MR altogether. The problem is, is as the more we sew this together, uh, the more we cause stenosis to occur. So we, there's a balance between keeping it open enough uh, so that it can function relatively normally, uh, but stopping that significant hemodynamically significant leak that's occurring. Uh, so that's, again, called an al alfieri or edge-to-edge -edge, uh, repair. This is uh, kind of a cool one here. I'm going to show this. I think the next slide is, uh, okay. I'm going to jump to this slide first and we'll go back and show the video of this. So this is the, uh, the echo version of it. Um, basically, we're, we're taking that valve. We're going to assess the valve entirely. First, this is all transesophageal, as you can tell by these images um, of that sector and the, the degree of angles there. 
uh, the leaks are shown on your color doppler and so forth. So that, these are just ways that we quantify uh, how much is going on. Uh, but we also assess it after surgery as well to show that it's in fact reduced the amount of leaks to an acceptable level. Here, and, and Darren has one of these in his office, it's a $40,000 clip. Okay, this is called a micro valve clip. So instead of, um, instead of sewing that together like the Alfieri technique does, this is actually a clip that goes in and tries to capture those leaflets uh, and leaves a clip in place instead of a sewn, you know, instead of opening the heart and sewing that into place. Um, but same concept is you're simply trying to gather those two spots that are leaky really bad and uh, stopping that. So I'm going to show the video of it because it's kind of a cool process. If uh, you get a chance with Darren and you're in house here and he's here, ask him to show, show you the micro valve clip. He got it because that valve um, expired. Meaning that if it doesn't get uh, surgically implanted in a certain time frame, they can't use it. And so they donated it to school at $40,000. That's just for the device. Sounds a lot better than the uh, alternator on my car or something. All right, so <clears throat> again, kind of what it looks like. Uh, they're going to come in. They're going to puncture a hole actually through the interatrial septum. They're going to come down and then into the valve. They're going to capture the valve leaflets wherever they're leaking. Now, this is going to be partly determined on where your um, where the uh, scallops are that were leaking. So that's part of our job is to prove where that was. This is kind of what it looks like with it open. So you got these little uh, flaps that are open here. Notice these little barbs that are sticking out here. That's going to actually, uh, when these flaps shut, they're going to capture the tissue on the, these barbs, and it's not going to let it uh, the tissue pull out of that. So it's going to hold the tissue in place. Uh, you can actually reopen it and close it as many times as you want, but once you let it go from the catheter, it's on its own. Okay, they may place one or two of these on the mitral valve, so you know you could have a couple of these placed depending on how big that uh, regurgitation is. And this is the catheter device that helps you control, you know, where it goes and stuff like that in the cath lab. And that gives you a relative size uh, of that. So to finish off, I'm going to just show this video. Uh, do we have any questions at this point? Yeah, I had a question on how common is rejection of, of a valve? Um, I don't, it's not nearly as common as it used to be uh, for these types of things because the materials are so good and they're very, um, I'm going to say hypoallergenic. It's probably a horrible term for this, but you get the idea. Um, they have a very good tolerance because um, the the material types are not very interactive with the tissue, so it should be pretty good. So not, and, and that's where the tissue valves might have some, but typically the valves don't have as much reaction as like a heart transplant would, for example. Uh, where you've got more bulky muscle tissue and stuff like that. So the, the valvular type of stuff is um, because it's that uh, fibrous type of tissue, it's not usually very reactive uh, towards the immune system. Or our immune system is not reactive towards it the same way that uh, other types of transplants would be. So it's pretty good success to that point. Can we go this? Scott, could you please summarize um or like highlight, what do we need to know for competency exam from this chapter? So on a, if I was to take this on a competency exam, so the whole point is on this is when I go into the room with an echo, what do I need to show the, a valve replacement or repair? So you tell me, let's just start the discussion. That's a good discussion. What, what do you think you would want to see when you go in to look at a valve replacement, first of all? In a 2D, we probably should see how good was replacement, how good it's seal in the area. Okay, we want to make sure that it's sewn in correctly. Good. What about the valve itself? You want to make sure it's functioning. Yes. It's good. So properly. it's supposed to open and close. It's supposed to let flow through the middle of it, right? So that's good. So we want to show that. So in 2D and in M mode, we can do that. So let me uh, let me put this out there for you. So in 2D, that makes sense that you can see it opening and closing. How do you tell if it is in M mode? 
we can see how much is open to. Okay. So yeah, you can run a cursor through the leaflet where it's supposed to be, and you can see the motion. It's going to look different than a native valve, but you know, if I've got a line going through a valve here, and say it was a ball valve, for example, so I've got the ball here, I've got my line coming through here, um, and so this line drags out into just this flat line here. As the valve opens, that line comes up and then down and then up and then down. And so you're just looking at the motion with M node similar to what you do as 2D. But yes, we, we definitely want to prove the function of the leaflets or the, the structure itself, however it's supposed to work. So if it's a bioprosthetic valve, we want to show that. We can still show cut separation, for example, on a, bi on a, a bioprosthetic valve in aortic position as compared to in the long axis. Um, <clears throat> anywhere that we can run a cursor through an M mode through the valve uh, itself and looking at those leaflets and seeing how they move, the point is just seeing the motion. Okay, if it's not moving when it's supposed to be, that's a problem. So yes, so those are good points. Um, we're also looking, in addition on 2D, we want to see if there's any gaps around the outside of the annulus. So if it looks like there's a 2D gap somewhere, that's bad. And so we want to show that. And then what do you think the next step would be after doing this 2D? Color. color. Okay, so color Doppler. So in color Doppler, we're looking for leaks. Um, again, we're looking at flow and leaks through the middle of the valve, but also looking for leaks around the outside of the valve. Okay, so if I did see that hole around the outside in 2D, I want to see if that fills in with color or not. It's like par paravalvular um, leaks, right? Yes, yes. So we generally do not want to see those. Good. Um, and we're looking for rocking motion to see that the structure is stable. Uh, so again, in color Doppler, we're just kind of looking for leaks around it and through it. Uh, and then in spectral Doppler, we're taking a look uh, with that just to see, just to prove, you know, if there is regurgitation or stenosis occurring, uh, that will help to quantify how much that's happening. So we would do Doppler. So, so far as primary stuff, anything that shows me the valve structure itself in 2D and in M mode and in color and in Doppler, shows me the valve directly, that's, that's primary information. Um, in addition to that, the secondary information would be dilated chambers beyond or before that, those kinds of things, just like you do with the native valve stuff. Good. And, and, and really, so it, it's really a matter of just showing me the structure and you know, taking measurements that are relevant, um, that type of stuff. So, and then it depended on uh, which valve we're, we're replaced with talking about the views, right? Yes. Okay. So the only other thing with this compared to a native valve is that we know because of the shadowing and stuff that happens that we need to get a little bit more creative to see around the entire valve structure. Um, so compared to a native valve, I might need to get extra windows to show that. Now, I don't know what Tyler's doing, but I will say I don't really test on prosthetic valves for the confidence. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. It are, can you see the annulus, like the rocking for the dehiscence or leaks, you know, like the space, a gap on M mode? You maybe see it on M mode. If it's big enough to see in 2D or M mode, uh, that's a pretty big gap. Um, usually those leaks are going to be more evident early with color Doppler. Um, theoretically, yes, you could see it with M mode, but if it's that big, you got you got a lot more proof going on already because the, the lesions that color Doppler on spectral Doppler is significant. Right, but I, I thought I heard you say that if we could see a gap in 2D, I think that would be pretty big if we could see it in 2D. Yes, definitely. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and if you could see it in 2D, you can probably see it in M mode also. In fact, what might be helpful, and, and I'm not aware of people doing this, there probably are some, uh, but you could actually stick color M mode on and have it through that space where you see that gap and you would uh, see color aliasing going through um, as it's leaking. So that could actually be quite helpful. <clears throat> Further proof, right? Further uh, tools in the toolbox, more evidence to show. More yeah. cool stuff. Yep. How easy is it to see the single leaflet um, tilting 
valve on M mode. Uh, it's, pretty easy it's a pretty big leaflet. It pretty much the entire circle has got basically a dish shape that's the size of that. So it's just tilting back and forth. Uh, the bi leaflet uh, takes up the same amount of space. It's just now you've got two little leaflets going in the same space. So they're, they're pretty, pretty good to see. My student didn't make the example. I think, well, they did make an example of bi leaflet, but uh, that's the one that got broken. So instead of a box, you would just see it do this, open, close? So it would be in the yeah, middle. Instead of, let me, here it is. Um, Uh, anybody know what color section it's in in uh, the pocket reference? That was really hard to read. For the prosthetic valves itself? Prosthetic, there we go. Uh, yeah. Brown well, for I'm the just curious if they got pictures. The old book used to have pictures of M mode uh, valve replacement. Yeah, I'm not seeing enough answer. Let's Google some. Try to find one here. Okay, so this is a St. Jude leaflet. So if you can look at the reference image up here on the right, um, they're coming from peristernal long axis view. So it's not going to be perfect, but they're running through, they're hitting one of the leaflets here. So what we're looking at is when valve is open, you don't see anything because it doesn't hit the line. When it closes, you see this hard uh, flat line. So in a normal M mode, we see the, we see the M shape. Okay, but here we're just seeing an opening with reverberations behind it, and then it, when it's uh, that's when it's that's open. When it closes, that disappears. So it just um, and that that's that position. Let me jump down maybe to another one. Same thing here. It's coming more into the valve of transesophageal. Uh, but you're seeing when the valve leaflet's open, you get this <clears throat> very reflective structure that comes out with a lot of reverberation behind it. And then it changes and then it's uh, it's out of the view here. So it's a big blank space. And then you got this, the blank space, and you got that. And you can see that this person's heart's obviously irregular as well. Um, let's see. So on M mode, that's pretty much what you see is you're looking for those reflective surfaces that um, kind of come and go. Let's do that. Before we get too much farther, let's let's go show you this mitral valve clip. And then if we've got time, let's maybe just show some pictures and we'll sum up. We'll do this first. Oh, don't tell me it was. All right, I think they took the video down. Dang it. It was good video. Should I give feedback? I'm disappointed that your uh, video got taken down. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, hey, our alternative is let's uh, maybe YouTube some of this. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, Again, this might be a little bit choppy just because we're doing this via Zoom, but you can you can certainly Google some of these or YouTube uh, some videos uh, to show these. So this is a clip implantation. What I liked about the other one is it was a, a 
3D rendering, like a computer generated rendering instead of like an echo. We're going to probably see some 3D echo stuff here. But what's nice is that it actually showed you coming in a, um, a demonstration from the manufacturer, which is kind of cool. This is more likely just to be an echo. Looks like we've got some AI going on there, but you see the big MR as well. Big MR is wrapping right around. And that's all that clip shows. And this is here, this is transesophageal. You can see the detailed difference in these images compared to the transthoracic. The PEE is great. You can see that big, big jet, and big gap in there. Probably doing PISA here. Like this is still image. Yeah, this is doing PISA. So they're showing you the actual gap across here. The shell is accentuated that by changing the color baseline. Notice in this case, they moved the baseline up to accentuate the shell. That's because the direction of flow is going opposite of what we're used to uh, for this. 3D of it. So you can see in the 3D, there's actually going to be like gaps and stuff there where there's see that depth right and see these kind of holes. So I'm going to get a 3D perspective that that on pos view of that area that's leaking. Okay. So this is the, the device itself being run into the intraatrial septum and down into the valve. So this is where you might see 3D applied in the clinical setting. If your facility does that kind of thing. And that looks like a mitral valve clip that's getting ready to be placed. This is after placement, I think, with uh, that that uh, double orifice. So you see, it looks like they might have placed two clips in here. It looks like one there, one there. And you can see that there's a hole here and a hole there for those double orifice. Dang it, I wish, that, I wish they didn't get rid of that video. That was kind of cool educational video as far as how they did it. <clears throat> and you might find that somewhere out on, on YouTube. Certainly take a look around. And then this looks like it's probably after the fact. Remember how big that regurgitation was? There is still some regurgitation, but not like it was. Um, you can still see the AI that's going on there as well, because obviously we didn't touch that. So let me go back to the top where that initial regurgitation, see how much that was? It was coming back and wrapping right around the other side. So it went from this to. So this was uh, one month after the procedure. It's still decent. It's still at least a mild to moderate, but much better than it was. Do they usually do just one follow-up after a procedure, or do they just wait for them to have symptoms long ways down the road or something? Uh, there, there probably is a, it probably depends on the doctor for one, but it probably depends on uh, if they are symptomatic for sure. If they are symptomatic, they're going to check it out. Uh, they might be following it up though at a regular interval. It might be a little bit more uh, spaced out than that. It depends on the doctor comfort level at that one. Is the clip itself just one size? They don't make multiple sizes? I don't believe they make multiple sizes. I believe it's just one size. So if uh, if one doesn't fix it, it's not uncommon to place a second one. But based on those prices and the inflation wasn't quite there yet, um, that was forty thousand dollars a few years ago. So that would be eighty thousand dollars of equipment inside the uh, person for that. So you can imagine how expensive the overall procedure is with the doctors and you know the allied health staff and stuff that are used to run it, as well as the equipment and all that stuff. Um, pretty pricey. But still better, in my opinion, to get my chest cracked open. And then to close up that uh, interatrial septum, what do they just use a the butterfly? Oh, yeah. if, 
they need to. So they could theoretically leave it open. It depends on if that patient is susceptible to blood clotting and stuff like that. Uh, if it's a big enough hole, then they might put what's called an end plaster device in, which is kind of that double little, it's got a core that goes through the hole and then like a double uh, umbrella type thing, it kind of clamshells it together. So they could do that uh, if, uh, if that hole was big enough. To my understanding, they don't necessarily need to close that up because, like I said, there's a lot of people that uh, walking around with uh, ASDs or PFOs that, if they're not susceptible to blood clotting and things like that and embolizing, and it's not a stroke risk, they don't worry that much. But if it's creating problems, they certainly would. <clears throat> I mean, they're there. Well, and too, they'll have to be on some sort of anticoagulation, anyways, right? Yes, they will. I'm sort of stuck on a loop on my uh, internet here. Anyway, I'll kind of end it there. Feel free to take some, uh, do some YouTube clips and stuff like that. I think uh, there's some great uh, examples. Maybe you can find that one from Abbott. Um, I, I like the, uh, that video that they had, but uh, it's not there anymore. So, um, but those different vendors might have some good stuff to help, and they usually use that to kind of teach patients what uh, what the procedure is all about, so that they have an idea. Any other questions on prosthetic valves, devices, annuloplasty rings? Look for abscesses, look for anything that's not belonging where it is. Todd, are you on campus today? Uh, yes, I got a couple of meetings, but I'm on campus. Uh, do you have time today to, for a quick sure. meeting? What time are you thinking? I don't know. I don't know when your meetings are. <laughs> um, my first one starts at 12. Let me, let me look. But yeah, I'll be here today. I'll be here tomorrow. Let's see if I'm up here. Hang on. Um, I should probably be done by about 2. Okay. You want to meet me at 2? Sure. Okay. I'll find to meet you at 2. All right. Um, before we end today, I did have a couple of questions regarding next week's schedule. Sure. Um, as far as the midterm goes, there's a couple of points of conflicting information on Canvas. Is it due at 9.30? Is it due at 12 p.m.? Is it due at 11.59? Let me pull it up. Uh, I think the midterm I'm going to open for the day. It should be open. I'll probably open it. Uh, well, let me see what I've got it set up. Like. And then we don't have class. We're not going over any new information that day. Do we have class at all? Uh, no, if it's midterm day, that's just, just for the midterm. We do not need to have class. Okay. We have class on the 4th, but there's nothing scheduled. Is it a review for the midterm? Uh, yeah, usually we'll, let me just uh, pull out the schedule here real quick. Let me just pull up the uh, test itself real quick. It looks like the midterm is open for, for the day for 6 a.m. to midnight. Okay, yeah, that's so that, that will be true. That, that'll be accurate then. Yes. So it's 50 points. 75 minutes, uh, yeah, 6 a.m. to midnight. Good, so that should be good for that. Let me just pull up the schedule real quick. Okay, so we have that on May 6th, will be the midterm exams, so that's Thursday. Uh, campus development day is May 5th. So that's the day before. So we don't, we're not allowed to have classes that day. There's actually faculty training stuff we have to be at. Um, <clears throat> so we've got ECHO and CAD 
uh, the remainder of this week, so tomorrow and Thursday. Uh, May 4th, we'll have this ECHO and CAD open for quiz, but we will, we will do Zoom on May 4th to review stuff for the admission. So that'll be a review day, and we'll just plan to Zoom it. Okay, thanks. But Thanks for clarifying, yeah. Larissa, if there was class on the 6th or not, too. I appreciate that. Yeah, my big test, I don't usually do tests. I don't do tests in the class the same day. So yeah, we'll give you that. So midterm and the final, obviously the final is going to be content, right? But yeah, good. Sound like a plan? Good, good. All right. Well, happy studying and uh, enjoy some sunshine. Thank you. I should probably stop saying that because you should really be studying, and echo is not really necessarily good to work, look at out in the sunshine. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> not saying I wouldn't try because I would. <laughs> All right. You guys have a Thank good day. You, we'll see you. Thank uh, you. You too. Thank you.